problems with programming related problems having it and causal inference related problems uh, relating to do with uh, mark uh, media mix monitoring so the idea here is well we want to figure out so in, in marketing we have a problem called attribution which is to say that if i take an advertisement over here and i take an advertisement over there and sales go up which one of the sources of uh, advertisement actually drove sales and there is a uh, there's a few papers i could read but you know reading papers on a stream is tough uh, so i figured i'd go and see if i couldn't find any videos found this pymc video um which i think might be interesting uh yeah and sorry i did not announce this i was busy this morning i i try to announce or post in the forum when i'm going to be uh live wherever in streaming uh, and, and and when and so uh i, I dropped the dropped the ball this morning but i'll try and get better about doing that let's see here let me see open a new tab real quick for this all right let's go ahead and run that hello this is a Bayesian approach to media mix modeling using PyMC3. My name is Mike Jones. I'm a data scientist at HelloFresh in the US. The work I'm going to present today has been done in collaboration with my colleague, Xin Yu Wang, who's a senior business intelligence analyst at our offices in Berlin. So we'll start off with a brief overview of marketing at HelloFresh, explain what a media mix model is, talk about the structure and function of the model we built in PyMC3, uh, touch on our Bayesian model building workflow, and then wrap up with a discussion of model applications and business use cases. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service. When a customer signs up, they select the number of meals they want and the specific recipes, and then five to seven days later, they get a box of ingredients and recipe cards that allow them to make a fresh, hot meal. We currently operate in 14 countries. Uh, we started in Germany in 2011. Our US operation launched in 2013. And this year, we added our newest country to the mix, which was Denmark. <clears throat> For the last seven to nine years, our major focus has been growth. And so marketing has played a critical role in that oh, business. So our yearly budget is about $300 million, and our marketing is varied and it involves a complex mix of channels in both offline and online segments. So that's anything from Facebook and Instagram to television and billboards. Uh, we use marketing throughout what we refer to as the marketing funnel. So uh, in the upper funnel, you have channels that tend to be offline, things that build awareness of the brand. In the mid funnel, you have a mixture of more online and offline channels that are designed to build on that awareness. And then at the bottom of the funnel, you have what are mostly referred to as direct response channels, things that allow people to translate their interest into a conversion. So these are sites like Groupon, um, app stores, uh, and most familiar to most of us probably is search engine marketing. So measuring and optimizing our marketing effectiveness is a key data science task that we engage in as we try to grow the brand and achieve profit. <clears throat> so how do we measure the effectiveness and efficiency of our marketing? The primary way we do this is by looking at the cost to acquire a customer. And that is simply the amount of money we spend in a particular marketing channel divided by the total number of customers we acquire through that channel. And the primary means we use to understand what channels are driving customer acquisitions is through voucher promotion. So typically when you see an ad, it will be accompanied by an offer and a promotion code. Okay, so yeah, I, so I, like I said, I work on probabilistic programming, I work on causal inference. And a big, obviously, a big practical application of causal inference is, is this problem of, uh, what do you call it, media mixture modeling. And this is a tutorial, well, this talk was given at some Py, uh, Python developers conference, it's using PyMC, which is a probabilistic programming language. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll learn something interesting here. And so that you as the prospective customer are encouraged to go to our site, sign up and redeem that code. And in doing so, that gives us information about the marketing channel uh, that was the primary driver of your becoming a customer. Now, there's a number of limitations and challenges that arise when we try to measure marketing this way. So in a digital space, I want to make sure I understand the problem, right? So we, we got a channel. 
when I say it's Facebook uh, voucher and we give them some kind of redemption, they go back to the site, use a, prom a promo code. What is this? Cost to acquire. So what is this? What are these variables? I'm not clear. All right. So what's wrong with it? Um, voucher attribution works fairly well because there's little friction between seeing an ad in your Facebook feed, clicking through it, and signing up um, using that code. However, when it comes to offline channels, uh, the voucher redemption approach can be a little tricky. So okay. you might imagine seeing an ad on the bus or on the subway, uh, thinking this is an interesting product, I want to look into this, uh, but it's sometime later before you actually have the chance to go online, and at that point you've probably forgotten the code. But so I got QR code. You might not be able to get a clean read on the fact that it was really that um, advertising in public transportation that brought you to our site. So there are methods for measuring offline marketing, such as lift tests or non-experimental approaches like geo-experiments, but those can be done only um, every once in a while. So for an ongoing measurement solution where you can track the effectiveness of your marketing on a weekly or monthly basis, um, voucher redemption has some serious limitations. So this is where MediaMix model comes into play. A MediaMix model um, actually offers a really elegant solution to these challenges of trying to get a comprehensive view of marketing effectiveness from both online and offline channels simultaneously. So the MediaMix model uh, is a fairly old concept, and it's simply a multivariate regression model that is built to estimate the impact of your marketing activity, in our case, uh, the amount we spend in a channel, on uh, some uh, key performance indicator. So for us, that is the number of new customers we acquire. So this basic idea was uh, put forth in the 60s by Neil Gordon. And uh, traditionally, it's, these models have been built using frequentist ordinary least squares methods. Uh, they, were, they were quite popular across a number of different industries, um, though they fell out of favor somewhat uh, 10 to 20 years ago when digital advertising and digital measurement became the real um, hot topic in marketing. Um, but there's been renewed interest as people have begun to realize that um, digital measurement has a number of uh, limitations, uh, those of which I discussed earlier, which is difficult to measure online channels simultaneously. So a uh, media mix model has a basic linear regression structure because it is essentially a linear model. So in our model, we have an outcome, which is the number of customers we acquire each week. And then we have a set of focal predictors, which in this case are variables representing the amount of uh, marketing spend in each marketing channel. Now, typically what's done is these channels are transformed using two types of functions. First is a nonlinear function that allows us to account for the diminishing returns on advertising. And the second is what's called an ad stock transformation. And this allows us to capture and model um, lagged effects that advertising can have over time. So for example, it's typically assumed that marketing through television has an ad stock effect, meaning that the uh, effect of that advertising is going to stretch out over some period of time, decaying at some rate. And then finally, uh, we include control variables to capture seasonality, uh, changes in some of our discounting tactics that we use. You can also include secular trends that capture uh, market dynamics like interest in uh, meal kit services in general. So just to touch on these uh, transformation functions, right, let me go back. Um, as I mentioned, the first function uh, gives us a way to model dimension and to stretch out over some period. All right, so now, okay, so we apply this nonlinear function transformation to account for diminishing returns on spend. I, I want to see what that is. That seems like a that seems weird. That feels like the linear model itself might be an odd choice or an unnatural choice. And then we have some adjustment here for confounders, which means that we're trying to we're essentially trying to coerce a causal model into a linear format, which may or may not work. And so we're summing up overall. Excuse me. All, overall, the over the different channels. And then, where are what kinds of controls do we have? Seasonal discounting tactics, etc. Okay. Period of time decaying at some rate. And then finally, uh, we include control variables to capture seasonality, uh, changes in some of our discounting tactics that we use. You can also include secular trends that capture uh, market dynamics like interest in uh, meal kit services in general. This is a time series model then, right? Because we're like, why, why time t? It looks like we don't actually regress on, we don't look at previous time points in the series. Control variables to capture seasonality, uh, changes in some of our discounting tactics that we use. You can also include secular trends. That so this capture... is assuming that, you know, basically all of the all of the causes of when we acquire customers is a function of advertising and these controls. Uh, 
market dynamics like interest in uh, meal kit services in general. So just to touch on these uh, transformation functions briefly, um, as I mentioned, the first function uh, gives us a way to model dimensional returns, and we use a nonlinear function, a uh, logistic-like function with a single parameter mu. And the mu controls basically how quickly the curve will saturate. So when mu is low, say around one, you get a fairly linear effect, uh, but as it increases, and say at a mu of seven, you get a very saturated curve that rises quickly and plateaus uh, quickly. Uh, so Absolutely. Uh, like I said, as a as a function to measure how advertising effects uh, carry over and decay over time. So we typically use what's referred to as a geometric decay function, mm -hmm. and the primary parameter there is um, alpha, and this is basically the decay rate. So uh, as alpha increases, uh, the rate of decay slows over time. So here you can see that uh, with an alpha of one, you get a very short decay, basically about a one week, uh, one and a half week time frame. Uh, but as you move up in alpha and get to around 0.8, um, the decay rate slows. So there are all these hyperparameters so that, that we're going to have to try and um, carried out over a longer yes, period of time. using a Bayesian approach. So this is just a plot to illustrate uh, what those functions do in practice when you apply them to some raw data, which is represented here by the black line. So the blue dotted line is um, that same raw data transformed with our reach function um, in a mu of two. And so you can see it puts an upper limit on how high um, that value can go, which is a way of um, representing a saturated effect. Uh, the red dotted line is the same um, spend variable that's been transformed with an ad stock um, and a decay rate of 0.7. And so you can see here that <clears throat> that ad stock essentially smooths out uh, the pattern and sort of eliminates these peaks and valleys, which is um, caused by the effect of the marketing dollars being stretched out over time. And then the last uh, line, the green dash line, uh, provides a view of what happens when you combine these two uh, transformations, which is typically what we do for subsets of channels that we assume would have a decay effect, but we also want to model the saturation. Now, recently, uh, some statisticians at Google actually proposed building a MMM using Bayesian methods to um, model these saturation and light effects. And there's four key benefits to this approach as we see it, and this is what really got us excited about this uh, basic framework. So first, in a Bayesian uh, method, you have the ability to con set constraints on your model parameters using the correct priors. And so for us, this is useful because we would assume and we would not want any marketing activity variables, our marketing spend variable, to have non-negative effects, right? We assume that marketing should always at least have a positive or zero effect. Uh, second, the um, inclusion of priors allows us to incorporate our existing knowledge about the effects of advertising. And that can come from <clears throat> expertise of our stakeholders, but primarily we get that information from external benchmarks that we extract from A-B tests or lift tests or geo experiments. So we have an external ground truth and we can use that basically to tune the parameters of our model to make sure that it's lining up with um, uh, what we know about how each channel should be working. Thirdly, we can learn the parameters for our uh, transformation functions, our saturation and our, and our decay functions as part of the model fitting process. And in particular, what's important is that we can also get estimates of uncertainty on those functions. So typically in an OLS framework, um, finding those parameters, the mu and the alpha, would require some kind of iterative optimization process that would likely involve some manual tuning. And then lastly, as we're probably all familiar with, um, Bayesian models produce a nice generative model that is well suited to uh, doing simulations. Okay, so like, okay, let's so actually review. What does our mean based model look like? So I'm going to return parameters, the mu and the alpha. He's like, I, I don't know why this is particularly innovative, but like, yeah, obviously you would want to do this. Uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of parameters. We don't want to have, you know, those coefficients could be positive. So it could be negative if you, um, in that optimization, so you could you can put some constraints on that. Although, although you could do that with, a, uh, well, yeah, if you had some kind of, uh, you know, optimization, optimization algorithm for the original line, you could put constraints on that too, but it's, but yeah, it's easy to put constraints here, not just in terms of, well, you can put constraints in terms of the, the, the upper and lower limits here, or I guess here, this one a lower limit, but you can also, of course, add constraints in terms of the shape of the prior, use the prior as a way to capture existing knowledge, related to learned saturation and decay parameters. All right, so we have those that mu, and I guess, I already forgot what the other one was, was it a lambda maybe? Uh, is in that in those nonlinear functions that they use to fit that linear model, and 
Yeah, that we can just simulate data. So this is all requires some kind of theory about the ancient stuff. process that would likely involve some manual tuning. And then lastly, as we're probably all familiar with, um, Bayesian models produce a nice generative model that is well suited to uh, doing simulations. Okay, so what does our medium mix model look like? So I'm going to return to the, the basic formula here and lay out the uh, structure of the likelihood and the priors as I walk you through. So um, our likelihood is going to be defined based on the expected value of new customers we acquire each week. Uh, we're going to need to set a prior on our on the beta for our uh, marketing channels. Uh, we'll also need to set a prior for the alpha parameter of our ad stock transformation that we apply to a subset of our channels. We need a prior for our mu parameter that controls um, the saturation curve that we fit for each channel. We're also going to need to set priors on the betas for our control variables, and then we'll need a prior for our noise term, which uh, plugs into our uh, likelihood. So this is the basic layout of the model. On the left side here, we have our likelihood, which, as mentioned, so what do we got going on here, huh? All right, so we got they just printed this all out because you're just you're, you're, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve channels, and I think it's just the same parameters for each one. So beta channel one scale. Mu, uh, mu channel one standard scale gamma, so it's going to be positive. So we got some scale parameters. Where's the actual betas? Wait, these are all scale parameters for these things. Don't. All right, so we just have a simply carry model of beta control one, beta control two, beta control three, for the month. For the year, all right. So this is our seasonal parameters, some other control parameters. Channel one, so beta, alpha, mu. Beta, alpha, mu. I'm not sure why they had that scale stuff up there. It must mean. I'm not sure if it's a height. Is it? Because it's they're all positive. Half normal, beta, gamma. These must be, uh, so this must be beta. This must be the, the parameters. And they just, I don't know why they have scale. They think it's kind of deceptive. It makes you think that these are all scale parameters. But um, yeah, they got one for each one of those additive functions. Uh, we define as a normal distribution. Uh, mu is basically going to be a function of the linear model. Um, and our uh, sigma term will stand in for the standard deviation. Now, the model that I'm going to walk you through uh, has five control variables and 12 channels in it. Um, all of the marketing channels are transformed with a saturation function, but only a subset are transformed with ad stock to represent um, and try to capture decay effects. So we'll start here with the control variables. So we uh, set priors there using a normal distribution and a sigma of 0.25. Now I should note that all of our input variables, uh, controls, marketing channels, and our dependent variable, uh, our outcome, which is uh, weekly customers acquired, are scaled so that they um, are between zero and one, right? So this is going to make it easier for our nut sampler to explore the probability space. And this is why you see a fairly low values on our uh, sigmas here. So next we set our priors on our marketing channels. And uh, as I noted, we want those all to be non-negative. So here we're going to use a half normal with a, a sigma of five. For the subset of channels that we um, transform with our ad stock function, we use a beta distribution with an alpha of three and a beta of three. So that gives us that nice rounded um, probability distribution function with a peak at 0.5. For uh, saturation, we uh, set a prior on our mu parameter as a gamma with an alpha of 3 and a beta of 1. And this well, ensures that our came mu from? parameter These is already positive. already choices for priors came from? And me, lastly, but... we uh, model or we set the prior on our sigma term using an exponential distribution. And I should note that the priors we're using for our uh, saturation and, and lag functions here are taken directly from Jen and colleagues. These are their recommended uh, OK, this is what I get the prior from the paper. So what does the model look like in code? Now, this is the basic layout. We start um, basically by creating an empty list. And what we're going to do is iterate through groups of variables. And um, we're going to build up the priors and then add those to the list. And then at the end, we're going to sum those up uh, to represent the, the mu parameter for our uh, likelihood. So in this first section, we're going to iterate through our list of channels that can have both decay effects and saturation effects. 
So here we set our prior on the beta, which is the half normal. And then here you can see um, we use that uh, nested transformation. So we're first transforming the marketing spend with our ad stock, and then that transform version is fed to our logistic reach function, which is going to model our saturation. So for those channels where we only expect saturation and we don't want to have any. Uh, All right, hold up. This, so this is when we have the KN saturation, so we get added delayed channels, channel B, half normal. Alpha response mean and then the logistic function. That's on, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I've never played around. I haven't played over with Pi MC three very much. It seems pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah, this is interesting. The cane ad stock effect. We simply only apply our logistic reach function. So same basic setup here. We set the prior on our beta and then uh, define the prior for the gamma and apply the transformation function. Next, we're um, defining the priors for a set of continuous control variables. So we have a set of variables that are basically um, monetary values. And so those can range from zero up to infinity in theory, but uh, they're, they're real values that um, can take on um, uh, floats, if you will. So um, we set a normal prior there with a standard deviation of 0.25. And then we have a set of categorical control variables. And here we're using um, an indexing method where um, we fit a prior, we define a prior for every level of the categorical variable. Um, and this is generally a technique that um, allow, makes it a little bit easier to find appropriate priors and fit them correctly. And then lastly, uh, we define our likelihood. Again, this is a normal distribution. The mu is gonna be defined by uh, the sum of uh, all of our uh, response variables. And um, our standard deviation will be defined by our prior sigma, which is an exponential. So just to dig a little bit deeper into these transformation functions, because this is one of the main challenges that we encounter when trying to implement this model. So when it comes to the uh, geometric ad stock, because of the nature of this transformation, we have to fall back on uh, TensorFlow uh, vector and matrix operations. So in the first step, we define a vector of weights, which is based on our decay rate alpha and that is extended out over a length L. And typically we set that to be 12 weeks based on the recommendations from uh, Jin and colleagues. And then we uh, define a set of um, vectors, uh, empty vectors of the same length. And then basically uh, take the dot product of the two to get our weighted estimate of uh, the outcome, or sorry, the uh, marketing channel variable over the time frame that we want the decay to happen. For our logistic function, it's a little simpler. We just um, apply uh, the function directly to our spend variable. And because we're only defining a discrete point one at a time, there's no uh, backward or forward movement. It's a pretty straightforward transformation. OK, so a little bit about our, our workflow. So typically, when we're building uh, the model and maintaining it, we start off with a, a baseline model with very weak informative priors. Uh, we fit that model, and then we compare those results, the parameter estimates we get, to our external benchmarks that are coming from A-B tests, lift tests, incrementality tests, and so forth. Uh, if we see a good um, calibration, we can leave it at that and move on. But typically, we need to do a little bit of tuning. So at that point, we um, work to adjust our priors, um, shifting them um, upward or downward or narrowing them as we need to to make them strict in order to help calibrate uh, the specific marketing channel estimates so that we can line them up to our external benchmarks. And then we run through the model fitting again, do a comparison, and we do that as long as it takes uh, to get the model calibrated to our external benchmarks. And then once that's done, we have some results that we can extract for our stakeholders and report out. So this is where we get into some of the applications that we found for this model in particular. Um, there's a number of different use cases that we uh, currently have for the model that include um, primarily strategic insights. So how well is our marketing working in total and, and how is it working at the channel level? Uh, we also use the model in doing uh, testing and simulation for uh, some of our marketing activities. And we've also more recently begun using it as part of a forecasting pipeline that uh, our stakeholders in finance and operations uh, find helpful. But right now I'm gonna focus specifically on our strategic insights uh, piece, because typically this is really what a medium mix model is for, which is you extract estimates of the incremental or true efficiency of your channels. And then from that, you can have a method or insights into how you can change the mixture of spend across your channels, how you can distribute that spend to get the most efficient mix of marketing possible. 
So one of the first things we typically do is just we look at the saturation curves that we can extract uh, from the model results. So at the top here, you see an example of a channel that we would say has low saturation. And this generally tells us that um, this is a channel that has room to grow. So you can see here at the point of our maximum spend, um, the reach curve is still pretty linear. So this tells us we could actually spend more than what we have uh, historically, and we would still be within a range of uh, acceptable efficiency. By comparison, on the bottom here, we have an example of a high saturation channel. So in this case, we can see that uh, at, our, at levels of historical uh, maximum spend, we're already getting into territory where our uh, marketing is starting to lose effectiveness and efficiency. And from this, we can also get an idea of what the optimal range of spend is for this particular channel. So um, it would be somewhere in the uh, portion of the curve that is linear. We can also take a look at our um, decay or ad stop curves to get a sense of you know, how long of a lag we see in particular channels. And this is beneficial because when a channel has a fairly long decay, uh, that might suggest that we can spend a little less in any particular week and um, extract more value and efficiency out of that particular marketing channel over time because that smaller input is going to have a longer lasting effect. So we're going to get a little more bang for our buck. So as you can see here, uh, this uh, red line represents a channel that has a fairly long decay of about uh, 0.82. So you know this is a channel where we might be able to pull spending back a little bit uh, and get squeeze a little more efficiency out of it. By comparison, uh, the channel represented here in the blue line has a much shorter decay of about two weeks. So we still might be able to um, get some additional efficiency from this channel, but um, wouldn't be as much as if the uh, decay was a lot longer. Now, really, uh, the ultimate goal, as I prefaced before, is to use the parameters that we extract from models. So the channel betas, uh, the shape of the saturation curve as we uh, fit it through the mu parameter, and um, the length of any decay effects that we estimate through our ad stock function fitting. And we can plug those into a constrained optimization formula. And typically what we want to do is try to maximize the number of activations that we can get in a particular time frame um, based on the coefficients from the model, uh, subject to constraints around the total budget that we have in a particular week, let's say. And um, the amount of that budget we're willing to put towards. Hold up. Lost the thread here. How did we get on constrained optimization? All right, so the great thing about learning these, these parameters, right, is that you can figure out which channels have longer impact. That's good. Now, really, uh, the ultimate goal, as I prefaced before, is to use the parameters that we extract from models, so the channel betas, uh, the shape of the saturation curve oh, as I see. we uh, fit it through the mu parameter, and um, the length of any decay effects that we estimate through our ad stock function fitting. And we can plug those into a constrained optimization formula. And typically what we want to do is try to maximize the number of activations that we can get in a particular time frame um, based on the coefficients from the model, uh, subject to constraints around the total budget that we have in a particular week, let's say, and um, the amount of that budget we're willing to put towards any specific channel. So for example, uh, we might have a channel that currently represents 20% of our budget, uh, but from the model's perspective, it's not very efficient. So we might want to shift the spending down, but we still might not want it to go completely to zero. So we might say, um, give us the optimal amount of spend um, in, within the range where we would only give 15 to 5% of our budget to that particular channel. And so from this uh, constrained optimization, we can get recommendations about how to shift our spend around. So not, it's not it takes into account would... saturation and lag effects. So in this case here, in this example, we are basically seeing that so the constraint of optimization is just to say that you have a fixed budget. You want to you estimate these betas. You want to figure out how to allocate these across betas. I guess what I'm missing is, yeah, it's not. I'm not. I know how I would implement that. I'm not sure how they would. In in. Yeah, I mean, if it were for me, and now we're using some kind of traditional Bayesian modeling type approach, then I would write a function that does an optimization under these constraints, and then average, uh, and then 
that'll give me optimal values of x and for each x and t and but then i need to average those values across a posterior of betas in other words one two seven eight and ten oh so um, that's a very powerful use highly case efficient okay. and there's opportunities to increase the spin there in order to maximize the overall efficiency of the spin that's just great. by comparison channels four and five and nine uh, are not as efficient as uh, we might want them to be and so uh, we might want to reduce spin there by a certain amount. Hold um, up, is, to are they sure not going to use the Bayesian uh, average? Not in a range that uh, shows a diminishing return. No. So <laughs> that <really> concludes <laughs> this presentation. I appreciate your time and attention, not too bad. and look forward to your questions in discourse. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to see what else we got for this. Uh... Uh, are they doing media mix modeling? Was it this? I think we just watched this one. Yeah, let's see what else. Uh, oh, here's another tutorial. Let's do the Bayesian next one. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on marketing mix modeling and optimization with Bayesian Networks and Bayesia Lab. Bayesia I'm delighted Lab. that you can join us today. Let me start off by introducing myself. My name is Stefan Konradi, I and I'm the managing before. partner of Bayesia USA, and I will be your host today. But beyond me, uh, to really, really to start. Yeah, I'll tell you something that I will never do. I'll never start a company and name it after a statistical technique. <laughs> that just seems to be a failure mode for me. SVM Lab. <laughs> of today's presentation is Bayesia Lab. That's our software, our principal product that allows you to encode, learn, edit, perform inference, analyze, simulate, and optimize all with Bayesian networks. So this is what you will see this afternoon in practice. So let me give you a quick overview of what we expect today. We will start off with an introductory example, kind of as motivation and background. We will talk about a fictional product, the generic 2000s new vehicle launch and a commercial for it. In this context, we'll see some of the difficulties of an establishing causal effect. We will see an example of Simpson's paradox, and that introductory part should probably take around 20 minutes or so. After that, we will get into the marketing mix modeling workflow proper. We will take a data set and see how with the things we learned earlier can perhaps build a new causal model that would allow us to analyze effects and ultimately optimize. But what we will realize that for this data set, for this more complex domain, we will be in, in trouble, in fact. Uh, we will not be able to solve it. So here, a major new finding comes in in the form of the disjunctive cause criterion. We'll see how we can use that in conjunction with machine learning with Bayesian Lab to build a model that ultimately allows us causal inference and optimization. That is the ultimate objective of this afternoon, and the second part should take approximately 40 minutes. So uh, one thing I should point out is that everything that you will see today uh, will be available in the form of slides, data, and a recording of the webinar. Now, given that today's program is very full, I will not have time to go into a lot of details regarding some topics. So I'd like to refer you to our book that is still available for free download on our website. So please take a look at that. Uh, many of you, I think, will already have downloaded it. So let me get straight to our example. And uh, for those of you who know me, you will not be surprised that this case study once again relates to the auto industry. But I, th I think it's a practical example that everybody can relate to. So imagine you worked as a marketing manager for the generic car company, and you are in the process of launching a new model, namely the generic 2000. And to launch this product, let me make sure things move to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, to launch this product, the generic car company runs a commercial at the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. That's when the, really the car makes its debut. And as you can imagine, um, such a commercial at the Super Bowl costs millions to produce and millions to air during the event. So given that you're the marketing manager, you obviously want yeah, to evaluate how effective this commercial was, and therefore you hire a market research agency to study that topic for you. More specifically, you conduct a survey of a thousand car shoppers to understand 
the effect of the Super Bowl on not just purchasing behavior, but also shopping behavior. <clears throat> Uh, specifically, survey respondents are asked about whether they've seen the ad, that's the variable for ad exposure, then gender, what is your gender, did you do a test drive of the vehicle, and then finally, did you purchase a generic model? So, um, and what we need to bear in mind is that all of that is observational data. So this is unfortunately not an experiment, rather we're asking after the fact whether people have, have seen the ad or <coughs> purchased the car. So, so what you can, you can see is going to happen here is that we're going to boil down this whole attribution problem to causal effect estimation. You're What's the causal effect of ad exposure on seeing the ad, on, on, on purchase? Very eager to get the results back from the marketing or from the market research agency. And you immediately run a cross tab with Excel. Your boss, the VP of marketing is waiting for the results as well. But unfortunately, the, the initial result that you get from that cross tab in Excel is a bit surprising. It appears when you summarize all 1,000 responses that those individuals who did not purchase or who did not see the ad purchased the generic brand at a 60% rate. Uh, for those who saw the ad, they purchased the... Okay, I know where he's going with this. As somebody who teaches causal inference, this is definitely going to be a Simpsons Paradox style kind of thing where it's going to look like it hurts, but then when you split it up by gender, by test drive, or, or all of them, then it'll, it'll actually look like the, it'll actually turn out that the ad improved things. I want to jump up. I want to jump into this whole. Uh, uh, map of analytic. OK. That's all good. Let's go see. Let's jump past the causal inference control stuff and let's dive right into uh, the actual example that is going to drive us. Uh oh, got gone too far ahead. It's buffering. There was this one golden. There's one time where YouTube would just just. Just download everything. Wouldn't try constantly try to optimize and do all this nonsense. Media, all right. Here, marketing makes optimization. So, new problem for advertisers because only. Uh, Recently, we had this extreme proliferation of media channels with social media and, and all these things. But as it turns out, this is a fairly old problem. And this quote, the following quote, I know I waste half of my advertising dollars. I just wish I knew which half. This has been attributed to John Wanamaker, Henry Ford, and JC Penney. Um, I'm not sure who actually said it, but mm -hmm. I, I think this is exactly the same problem we face today, except we have a few more channels to consider. So let's now specifically look at the, the use case or the case study for the Acme Generic Auto Center. This is what they have. Luckily, they have recorded their sales, marketing, and media data uh, for a, quite a long time. They, they started early. And for that reason, they have almost several decades of sales and media spend, uh, more specifically, these particular variables. TV advertising, direct marketing, print advertising, internet advertising, incentives, that's a very important one. Co-op promotions, this is when you have the manufacturer and the dealer jointly um, pay for advertising. Basically, if you pay half, then we pay half uh, kind of deal. Uh, importantly, they are also tracking competitive incentives. So they know what other dealers and other manufacturers, how they support individual transactions and so on. So this is all what they've recorded. And so perhaps you'll now say, okay, let's do the same thing that we did with the Super Bowl ad and introduce our theoretical knowledge about this domain. Let's create a causal network for all these variables. Great idea, but um, I think it's getting difficult. Um, yes, we could certainly start, and there, there are some variables that are totally in intuitive. You know, we, we can say, you know, it is print advertising that causes sales as opposed to sales causing print advertising. That's, that's fairly straightforward, but what about web traffic and internet advertising? Because, when you do internet advertising, you, you need somebody to you know cr cr have traffic in the first place, so you can bid on showing an ad to that uh, to the person who searches on Google, etc. So so there it's not entirely straightforward whether what comes first, or if you think about incentives, because that is obviously kind of a cat and mouse game where one manufacturer offers incentives, then the other one raises them, and then the, the other one responds again. So um, 
we don't know what comes first. Or even if you think about this co-op advertising, like if the dealer or if the manufacturer says, we co-fund your advertising if you do it, well, what is the cause then? So, so some of the relationships are easy to identify. Others, especially the, the relationships between our marketing variables, those are difficult. And, and so we will very soon run into a kind of dead end. Uh, additionally, um, the, the, one of the problems is that there are so many possible causal graphs. I mean, a lifetime would not be enough to evaluate all the potential relationships here. So, so we can't do that really practically. And this, this is still a fairly simple example. Obviously, there are many more marketing channels that would have to be considered. So, so what do we do now? So this path of uh, providing a causal network from our theoretical knowledge, that won't work. So what do we do now? Um, we need a different kind of theory. We need to do something revolutionary here because our traditional approach won't work. In fact, there is something that is revolutionary and that is the discovery of the disjunctive cause criterion. Mm. It was discovered by Van der Veele and Schwitzer and what they are saying is we... So we're in, we are now in, in definitely in potential outcomes territory, right? So we're saying that we don't know... I, oh. I didn't know Ilya Spitzer was at. Uh, no, I knew that. How did I? I thought I knew that. I knew that. Tyler Vanderwer, I knew he was there. But like, um, so we're in this problem. Like, oh, we don't know how to get the causal bag. We don't know how to draw a causal graph. So we're going to do something different. Can um, identify confounders, not by looking at a causal structure because that sometimes is just unknowable. Instead, we have a different criterion, and that is the following. We propose that control be made for any pretreatment covariate that is either a cause of treatment or of the outcome or both. So it's a very simple criterion that allows us to select confounders, what we need to condition on, without having the full structure. So this is what we can very easily implement in, in Bayesian Lab. Um, we can tell Bayesian Lab to uh, what we believe the confounders are, and then perform direct effects analysis and thus get to the causal effect, the advertising effect. We propose that control be made for any pretreatment covariate that is either a cause of a treatment We propose that control be made for any pretreatment pre covariate that is either a cause of a treatment or of the outcome or both. So if it's a cause of either, then you control for it. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to assume no observed confounders, which is a very strong assumption, and but we're just going to kind of analyze our data to see if you know. What, so one thing you can do is do a kind of structured learning approach and just take everything that's in the Markov blanket. No, no, everything that is a potential cause of uh, the confounder or the adjust or, or the outcome. Sorry, of the, of the uh, predictor or the outcome. What is important to know, though, is that we must assume that there are no unobserved confounders. That is something we absolutely must uh, be sure of. Unfortunately, that is an, a non-testable assumption. We simply have to um, justify that on theoretical grounds. Anyway. Well, well, it's not testable if you don't have a DAG. That's right. So let's now put this back into our slide here, into our map of analytic modeling. Now we have a new theory, and the theory is no longer knowing the full causal structure. The causal knowledge comes in indirectly through the selection of confounders, for which we now have a very simple criterion. That's the idea. And that um, is, is really very, very practical, because the predictive model we can very easily generate through machine learning. We will see that in a moment how that works. We can just take the data and machine learn a predictive model and then take this non-causal model, this non-causal predictive model, pick our confounders and then use that for our causal inference. And that is really, uh, I think, quite revolutionary. So here's the workflow uh, that we're going to use. We, and, and momentarily, I will switch into sure. Bayesian causal predictive model. All right, model purpose causation associated correlations. So the uh, split here, we're in a causal model. We're looking at the UX and M's. All right, we just, uh, this is just a, an overly complex image. It's just saying that we can, con that confound, that adjusting for confounders will allow us to go from here to here.
pick our confounders and then use that for our causal inference. And that is really, uh, I think, quite revolutionary. So here's the workflow uh, that we're going to use. We, and, and momentarily, I will switch into Bayesia Lab. We start off by importing historical sales and marketing data. And you will understand that the data I'm going to share with you is synthetic. Unfortunately, I cannot share with you any real data from our customers. For some reason, they are very particular about keeping their data confidential. But on the plus side, um, given that this data is synthetic, hopefully realistic though, uh, that will be available for download. And so you can experiment with that very data set yourself. So on that basis, we will machine learn a predictive model with Bayesia Lab. We will use the disjunctive cause criterion to establish what are confounders and non-confounders. Then we use the direct effects estimation to uh, obtain response curves, introduce function nodes for cost. And then it gets interesting because we will then proceed to uh, optimization. We will use a a genetic target optimization algorithm, and then comes something that many of you have waited for, and that is dynamic Bayesian networks. I will show you how we can perform network temporalization and uh, show you how we can basically take the existing contemporaneous model and turn that into a dynamic model and how we can perform optimization with that as well. So at this point, I will um, leave, uh, hold on, let me just make sure I do this correctly. I will leave PowerPoint and share Bayesia Lab with you. Let me make sure that that works. We should now momentarily see the, the Bayesia Lab screen. I think here we are. Okay. Now we can start by bringing in our original data set. And what I forgot to point out earlier, for, for these types of calculations, we really need quite a lot of data. So this, if you just have two years of weekly media data, that will not be enough to estimate a complex model of this kind. So we're really talking about thousands and thousands of observations, which luckily in a modern marketing environment is, is becoming easier simply because. So I'm not particularly interested in, in watching things happen in Bayesia Labs, although I, I do want to see how, because Bayesia Labs is a Bayesian network modeling software. And so if he's not going to fit an entire Bayes and them on a DAG. I'm curious to see how he does this disjunctive confounding thing. As we collect data at much higher frequencies than we've ever done before. Anyway, so here's my data set. I'm bringing it in. This is the first step of the data import wizard. We now see that Bayesia Lab recognizes the, the seasonal variables, the calendar variables as categorical. Here are the first four columns. And then all the remaining columns are a numerical continuous. So I don't need to change anything here. Now, here we would set the missing values processing algorithm. It's not even worth discussing it at this moment because we have so few missing values. So we can just um, skip over that. But one thing we do need to do is look at the discretization. And I'll just pick out one variable. Uh, let's see the showroom traffic. That is continuous that we now need to discretize. If we had specific domain knowledge, I could now manually introduce bins and, and perhaps some values are of a specific meaning, perhaps some relate to key performance indicators of an organization. I don't know that though, so I will use one of Bayesia Lab's most universal discretization algorithms, the R-squared genetic optimization algorithm, the discretization algorithm. So let me run that here. So now we found it for the variable showroom traffic, and but we now need to also do it for the remaining variables. So I will select all continuous, and apply the same algorithms for the same algorithm for all of them. So uh, let me click finish. It'll just take a moment. Okay, here we are. The BN Learn software does that as well, by the way. Make this larger. Let me stretch out the nodes a bit and uh, make sure that they nicely fill the screen. So here are now all the variables we we have from our original problem domain. And I said our next step will be to machine learn a predictive model. We now simply need to find a statistical representation of this domain to capture the joint probability distribution. And then separately, our causal knowledge comes in through selecting the confounders. So let's put that aside for, for the moment and simply learn our statistical model. Now, we certainly want to focus it on sales. That is very clearly our target variable. Later on, we want to optimize for that. And then we go into Bayesian Labs supervised learning menu. And here I will choose without further explanation, the augmented naive Bayes learning algorithm. And we could certainly experiment with, with others as well and see whether Whoa. we can improve upon the model. But for now, I'll just start with this simple and quick learning algorithm. Okay. So augmented, that's interesting. So augmented naive Bayes is a, is a variant of naive Bayes 
So here we're going to take sales and have it be a and have it be a root node that goes to every other node, and then we'll learn some other. And then once it's done that, it'll try to find. So that's so that's a naive Bayes classifier, or a naive Bayes model. I guess sales is in this case continuous, and then it will try to learn some other arrows here that will capture the conditional dependence between the other variables. And that's that's an odd choice because what you could have done is just learned some structure here. And well, so I assume what he's going to do now is to use these these, these non-dotted arrows to figure out kind of what are the parents of each of these other uh, nodes here and try to, wait, is that what he's going to do? Well, so what was the method again? Find, a, a, adjust for everything that's a cause of one or both. So if she's doing, if he's doing trial, tri, a naive, uh, augmented naive base, then nothing will be going into cells. Is cells the outcome we care about, or is it? Uh, let's see where it goes. Okay, so here's our first network. Let's perhaps arrange this in a slightly nicer way. For this, perhaps the radial layout is is appropriate. All right. So okay, everything so comes now out we of have cells. All our Variables. And then we have some other our, our entire network here. nicely arranged. Let's we can perhaps stretch this a little bit more. Okay, yeah, that looks nice. What I keep mentioning whenever we talk about Bayesian network learning is that we should do a sanity check. Does what we have learned make uh, any sense? So perhaps the first thing that we should check on, that we should review is, or the first question I usually get at this point is, why are all the arcs outbound? You know, aren't we trying to uh, predict sales or ultimately go beyond that and see what causes sales. Yes, um, we are, but remember I said we are only going to build a statistical model for now. And for a statistical model, for a predictive model, a structure like this with all outbound arcs is way more parsimonious than one with all inbound arcs. Theoretically, an, a structure with all inbound arcs would be possible, but just for the fun of it, I calculated how many observations we would need in order to estimate such a structure. If we had all the arcs inbound, the table, the conditional probability table that is associated with sales would be would have to contain billions of cells, or not would have to, would contain billions of cells that would have to be all filled or estimated with observations. So yeah, I calculated that in order to estimate such a network, we would require 450 million years of daily sales and marketing data. <laughs> and obviously even some very traditional brands don't have that much data. So. Okay, so this is more parsimonious. This is a more practical representation, but let me continue on the topic of uh, does this all make sense? <clears throat> Excuse me. And let me bring up our mapping function. I'll make it a, little <clears throat> a little bit larger, and now it seems like I'm losing my voice again. Okay, so here I have now represented our. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our network. Um, in, in a slightly different way using our mapping function. And I'm going to assign now mutual information to node size and Pearson correlation to the arc thickness. This gives us a sense of how important individual variables are with regard to sales, but important only in the informational statistical predictive sense, not in the causal sense that we will look at later. And here I would argue that probably makes sense that web traffic perhaps is even a proxy for sales. The more people come to your website, perhaps that is indicative of sales or calendar variables. People go car shopping on the weekend and so on. So we can look at that or we can also look at the sign of some of the relationships. And one that is worthy to point out is perhaps the link between sales and competitive incentives. This suggests as competitive incentives go up, our sales go down. That's plausible too. So we could now continue our sanity check and see whether all this makes sense. Uh, perhaps one more thing, and that is that certainly many of our marketing variables are all related and that they are related to the calendar. So everything is related to everything else, it seems. So, but now let's get closer to the question of causality. So now I'm going to look for our confounders. What here needs to be a confounder so that we can proceed to causal inference? Now, by default in Bayesian lab, all variables are confounders. So if I don't do anything, every single one would be considered a confounder. What I need to do is define the non-confounders. And 
uh, let's think well let's think about what what is what so i would argue tv advertising direct marketing print advertising internet advertising incentives they would meet the criterion of confounder are they a cause of the treatment are they cause of the outcome the outcome is sales so yes all of these would be causes of the outcome same thing applies to the calendar variables clearly you know um, the, by virtue of being a saturday that is a cause for more sales because more people go sh car shopping on saturdays so the the calendar variables would be um, confounders as well now what about the ones um, sort of in the bottom right quadrant here competitive incentives web traffic showroom traffic test drives co-op promotions and intuitively you would say yeah they are you know web traffic drive sales showroom traffic drive sales sure but they are not pre-treatment you know uh, one can argue that web traffic showroom traffic test drives are effects in themselves they are being caused by other marketing activities they are not pre-existing variables you know like the weather or like like the calendar so i would argue they belong into the class of non-confounders same thing with incentives because incentives are not just a fixed value but they respond to to what we're doing as you know we raise incentives they raise incentives so that is not uh, something first of all that we can control but it's also not something that stays fixed similarly with co-op promotions co-op promotions don't start up by themselves they start up if we and the manufacturer come together and say we do this jointly okay so with that i would argue that these variables here they should all belong into the class of non-confounders so i've declared them as such and to make to visualize this a little bit or to, to distinguish this visually, I will just assign a distinct color to all our non-confounders. So all the non-confounders are red. Now, I said all the calendar variables, they should be confounders, but they are a special kind of non-confounders because we don't have them under our control. They rather are what they are. We cannot increase the number of Saturdays, even though we would probably want to. So therefore, I'm declaring these as not observable variables that may be a bit misleading or counterintuitive i'm simply declaring for direct effects analysis and later on for optimization we should not take those into account so with that we are at the point where we can perform our initial analysis point. our first causal analysis and for that i'm going to use the direct effects function in bayesia lab let me run this this should just take a short moment and here is our results, our plot of the results. So you've essentially gone through all this and try and broke up the uh, broke up the variables into things that are direct and non and indirect. Okay. Okay, how can we interpret this? The x-axis refers to the normalized value of each of our marketing variables. So they're all on the same axis, so we can kind of compare them because you know one variable may be measured in dollars, another one in airtime, so they may have very different units here. They're all brought up to the same scale. And then on the y-axis, this is the, the number of sales in units. So let's go through those one by one. Here is our response curve for TV advertising. So it seems to be fairly steep initially as we start with the low levels of TV advertising. And then as we go up, it kind of flattens out a little bit. Let's go to the next one, internet advertising. That seems to be an S-shaped curve, initially flat, then it increases, and then it flattens out again. Next one is incentives. That has a pretty steep incline initially, um, and actually then continues almost linearly. Now what's next, direct marketing. This is kind of curious, it seems like beyond a certain point of direct marketing, of a direct marketing spend, it seems to become counterproductive. And perhaps if we get too many calls or too many pieces of junk mail from a, a company, perhaps that indeed has a negative effect on our willingness. Although this is not using the fancy um, nonlinear additive function. So this is just purely additive model, I think. Target mean analysis. Yeah, this is just like analysis of variance or something. So like, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the model that was proposed in the PyMC tutorial is a bit more sophisticated than this. Although this is this gives you a nice framework for kind of maybe picking which model, which variables you want to add. To purchase. And then finally, print advertising. That's also interesting. It looks like beyond a certain level of minimum spend, kind of the curve is pretty much flat. So it seems like we need to do some print advertising, but then the exact amount or spending more doesn't necessarily, you know, help us a lot. Okay. 
So these are our causal response curves. These are the direct causal effects of our marketing variables on sales. Now, how can we use that for optimization? Well, um, if we had unlimited budgets, we would simply pick the top spots of every curve. Let's say here, direct marketing, um, 50.82, you know, that's how much we should spend. And then for, you know, TV advertising, we just go straight to the max maximum amount and so on. So, but of course we don't have unlimited budgets. So what we need to do is somehow introduce cost. That's what I'm going to do next. I will create a variable, a special type of variable, a special type of node, um, more specifically oh, yeah, a yeah, function but, node that but, I will label cost. And this is a node that allows Bayesian Lab to compute or to summarize the values now. of all variables that we are considering here. And of course, we only need to sum up the cost of those variables we have we have to pay for. You know, we um, have to pay for TV, direct marketing, print advertising, but we don't have to pay for month or for competitive incentives. You know, some of these are either free or somebody else is paying for them. And you see this little warning triangle here. This means that we still have to define how exactly we need to sum up these variables. And this is now a very simple Excel style formula that I'm going to use, where I'm simply adding up the mean values of the all my marketing nodes. And just to keep things simple, I will assign a cost of $1 for each of them. Now, of course, it's unrealistic because, you know, TV may be measured in minutes of airtime and print in number of pages, who knows. And so I could now include very specific cost functions. I could include price table, discounts, you know, buy two, get one free, whatever my media vendor is willing to give me. I can include that all he in here and take that into account for optimization purposes. So let me accept that, or actually validate first, accept. And now we're almost ready for optimization, uh, but I need to formally tell Bayesia Lab that the node cost belongs to a certain type of class of nodes, a, a predefined class named resource. This means that Bayesia Lab will now look at cost as our overall budget variable. Okay, switching into the validation mode, going into target optimization, and of the three possible optimization algorithms I choose the genetic algorithm, comes up with a pretty big um, set of options here. And we don't have nearly enough time to go through all of them. Um, in some of our other tutorials, book chapters, we go into a bit of detail that explain why, why the, they are set the way they are set. Here, I just wanted to point out a few things. We want to optimize the mean value of the target node sales. We want to maximize it as opposed to perhaps minimizing it. We want to certainly take into account our resources, our budget, and I can specify the exact that budget that I have here. Now, I think it's good practice to start with basically the same budget that we've already had. So here I'm just taking the default value saying, how much more could we sell if we simply reallocated the resources we have historically been spending? And then with that as a starting point, then we could proceed and say, well, what if we had, if we could increase that, et cetera. Then uh, important here, oh, hold on, I forgot one thing because I only want to optimize these guys here. I, I don't, don't want to optimize on uh, competitive incentives because they are obviously not under our control. So let me start this again. Now we, we're only looking at those variables that we can manipulate ourselves in this domain. I can set individual constraints because perhaps on some variables I'm locked into a long-term contract with others, I have more latitude. Here, just to, to illustrate how constraints work, I'm setting a plus minus 50% constraint on each of our marketing variables. So within that constraint, we want to optimize. Okay, and now with that, we can let it run. I set a stop criterion that will automatically stop whenever Bayesian Lab cannot find a better solution. So I'll just let that run for a while. And with a genetic optimization algorithm, we need to bear in mind that in theory, or not just in theory, but unless we stop it, it will just keep going and searching. That's why a stop criterion is important. Or we can also manually stop it here and just say, okay, um, I want to see a result now, so let's, let's, let's pull the plug. So I think uh, given that we've only about five minutes left, I will pull the plug and stop and then see what the best, the best scenario is that we've found so far. Here's my report window. Expand this a little bit. And now I'd like to draw your attention to the table here in the center to the row that is labeled best solution. This now shows us what the best solution is that Bayesian Lab has found so far. It suggests we should reduce the amount of incentives, slightly increase direct marketing, uh, increase TV advertising, increase 
internet and print advertising too. So basically, it's reallocating budget from incentives and distributes it mm. to the other channels. Yeah, With please, that, please. and that's what we see from the bottom table, we would get an increase of 31 units of daily sales using exactly the almost precisely the same amount of resources. So that's the the currently best status. And then of course, at this point, usually somebody remembers, oh, we're, we have this contract in place, or oh, we can't do that. And then he would go back, set new constraints, and then rerun uh, the optimization again. But um, here I want to focus on something else because you might rightfully say, hold on, you know, this is all just done on a contemporary basis. You know, we've only looked at each day by itself rather than taking into account that some of these measures or some of these activities have a lingering effect. You know, my TV ad that I run today or that I ran yesterday or a week ago may still have an impact on the behavior yeah. of car shoppers. So there's a lag effect that we have not yet captured here. So of course we can do that. And now, um, unfortunately we can no longer stick to the radial layout, rather I will change the alignment and create a vertical distributions of, a vertical distribution of my variables. So they're now aligned uh, this way. And next I will use Bayesian Labs temporalization function. This creates a temporal clone of all these variables so we can uh, estimate the lags. To keep things simple and to keep the screen manageable and not overwhelm you with too many nodes, I will simply introduce a single lag. You now see that we have here a second no, a second row of nodes, and they are now labeled as T minus um, one. Let me just pull out here sales. Sales is still connected to all my nodes in time slice T, and momentarily I will also link sales to all the variables, all the nodes in time slice T minus one. But there are some nodes that I should probably remove in T minus one, and these are the calendar related variables because they may not. Um, make much sense because if today is Friday, then inevitably yesterday is Thursday. So I, knowing that yesterday is, was Thursday isn't really giving us any extra information. So uh, those I have removed and then furthermore, I'm also removing C sales for T minus one because that itself would not be a driver. Okay, now I'm connecting sales to T minus one. I, I'm basically, hmm. That's here a we go. I, I'm basically taking I mean, a little looks, shortcut you here. Know, like you and drew it in know, I'm basically paint. simulating the augmented naive mm. Bayes algorithm. I'm, I'm just um, yeah, approximating it or I'm kind of simul I'm doing that manually instead of doing that automatically. I am declaring all my nodes as fixed. And I am now doing the augmented part of the learning with a taboo learning. Oh, now he's gonna okay, so this is what I wanted to show you where, where something got hung up, but for some reason it always happens. Whenever I have GoToMeeting running in multiple screens and Bayesian Lab, uh, uh, perhaps I need to get a faster computer. So uh, this is what I wanted to show you. I wanted to demonstrate how we can perform okay, exactly so the same target correct effect analysis also with a temporal network here with one uh, lagged time slice, but we could certainly extend it to two or three or whatever you hypothesize being the relevant number of lags to include. But then comes the interesting part as we go forward, mm. and we could certainly then also optimize. It's actually showing a pretty interesting workflow here, which is that like if you compare it to the last one, which is told you to implement in PyMC, it's a more sophisticated parametric model, but this one allows you to kind of model structure much better, right? And and uh, you know, I've been an advocate for both approaches. Like to say, like, oh, let's use, let's fit a naive model here and kind of learn some structure, and then port that structure over into a more sophisticated parametric modeling setting, and and uh, uh, apply all the kinds of, you know, nonlinear, what did he call it, lag things, or uh, all these ideas that we and these nonlinear functions that they have in that PyMC paper to kind of capture typical ways that you, you know, that mu parameter and that other parameter that you were trying to capture, um, I think it was kind of like decreasing returns on marketing um, or on advertising as well as a kind of a lag taper off effect. So it'd be interesting to combine both of these approaches actually. I think um, um, the stat, uh, statistic, uh, statistician who wrote that Rethinking stat statistics, uh, the go craft. Uh, he he advocates the certain technique, and then so do I. Um, anyway, I'm gonna end it there today. Thanks for watching, and I uh, hope to hear from you next time.